The Great Gatsby, Chapter 3, by F. Scott Fitzgerald. There was music from my neighbor's house through the summer nights. So we've got his neighbor's house, so we're, we know that we're referring to Gatsby here. Um, and through the summer nights, so we've still got the seasonal reference here of kind of high time. In his blue gardens, men and girls came and went like moths among the whisperings and the champagne and the stars. We have an interesting contrast here where he uses men and girls. Um, so we've got kind of adult child relationship um, with the male female relationship. And we might question what that might mean about the types of people who come to these parties and the relationships between them. At high tide in the afternoon, I watched his guests diving from the tower of his raft or taking sun on the hot sand of his beach, where his two motor boats slit the waters of the sound, drawing aqua planes over cataracts of foam. Here in this sentence, I'm noticing the repetition of his. Um, it's his beach, it's his motor boats, um, it's his raft. Um, so recognizing the, the host quality here, that it's all of his things that are, that are being used. On weekends, his Rolls Royce became an omnibus, bearing parties to and from the city between nine in the morning and long past, uh, long past midnight. So here we've got his car uh, <clears throat> that is, again, hosting and taking care of the people. While his station wagon scampered like a brisk yellow bug to meet all tra trains, we do have a little bit of, um, of action, active uh, personification here. Um, as a yellow bug. Uh, so he's bringing people from the city and from the train station. And on Mondays, eight servants, including an extra gardener, toiled all day with mops and scrubbing brushes and hammers and garden shears, repairing the ravages of the night before. So noticing that we've got this uh, re reuse of the word and, lots and lots and lots of things um, that keep happening. This is polysyndeton is what's that, what that's called. Syndeton. Every Friday, five crates of oranges and lemons arrived from a fruiterer in New York. Every Monday, these same oranges and le lemons left his back door in a pyramid of pulpless halves. So we've got that shift from, um, from plenty to garbage. There was a machine in the kitchen which could extract the juice of 200 oranges in half an hour if a little button was pressed 200 times by a butler's thumb. So we've got this idea of excess. Um, of one person just to push this button to get all of the juice from these things. Um, and we're going to keep that going, all of this idea of materialism and excess, all the way through here. At least once a fortnight, a corps of caterers came down with several hundred feet of canvas and enough colored lights to make a Christmas tree of Gatsby's enormous garden. On buffet tables, garnished with glistening hors d'oeuvre, baked, spiced baked hams crowded against salads of harlequin designs and pastry pigs and turkeys bewitched to a dark gold. If we look at all of the imagery here, um, it's it's all visual imagery rather than we would think that it would be gustatory imagery, a taste imagery when we're talking about food, but it's more about how it looks than how it actually is experienced. The main, in the main hall, a bar with real brass rail was set up and stocked with gins and liquors and with cordials so long forgotten that most of his female guests were too young to know one from the other. And so again, here we've got the idea of prohibition and how it actually prohibits absolutely nothing. Um, in Gatsby's world, we've got gins, we've got liquors, and then we've got this idea that his female guests, those girls, are too young to know these cordials because either just they've just recently started drinking and because the any time that they've lived, they've not been uh, allowed to have alcohol in excess like this. By seven o'clock, the orchestra has arrived. Notice that we are in present tense right now. Um, this was all kind of generalized and now we are um, in present tense, which brings the reader along with the narrator that we are experiencing this at the same time. No thin five-piece affair, but a whole pitful of oboes and trombones and saxophones and viols and coronets and piccolos and low and high drums. And again, we've got this adding up of things rather than separating with commas. It just keeps on going and going and going without, without a whole lot of breaks. The last swimmers have come in from the beach now and are dressing upstairs, and the cars from New York are parked five deep in the drive, and already the halls and salons and verandas are gaudy with primary colors and hair shorn in strange new ways. This is a, this is a, um, a reference to the bob, um, which is a new hairstyle, short hair for women in the, in the 20s, and shawls beyond the dreams of Castile. 
The bar is in full swing, and floating, around, floating rounds of cocktails permeate the garden outside, until the air is alive with chatter and laughter, and casual innuendo and introductions forgotten on the spot, and enthusiastic meetings between women who never knew each other's names. So notice the kind of anonymity that goes, uh, anonymity, um, that's going on through here. It's just kind of things that are going on that you can kind of see from afar. Even though there's this big party going on, in theory, with a lot of noise um, and motion, we're kind of experiencing it as a whole from an outsider perspective. But yet the lights grow brighter as the earth lurches away from the sun. Beautiful verb there. Um, and this idea of kind of shoving us into a new uh, realm and now the orchestra is playing, we've got this repetition of now again, also reinforcing that we are in the present, is playing yellow cocktail music. And the opera of, of voices pitches a key higher. Laughter is easier by minute by minute, spilled with prodigiality, tipped out at a cheerful word. And we've got these things like spilling of drinks. The groups change more swiftly, swell with new arrivals, dissolve and form in the same breath. Already there are wanderers, confident girls who weave here and there among the stouter and more stable, become for a sharpness moment the center of the group, and then, excited with triumph, glide on through the, through the sea change of faces and voices and color under the constantly changing light. So we've got this just kind of motion that's like a kaleidoscope, but it almost feels uh, orchestrated, like the orchestra. Suddenly, one of these gypsies, in trembling opal, seizes a cocktail out of the air, dumps it down for courage, and, moving her hands like Frisco, dances out alone on the canvas platform. Um, this is a, an illusion that certainly is worthwhile to look up. A momentary hush. The orchestra leader varies his rhythm obligingly for her, and there's a burst of chatter as the erroneous news goes around that she's Gilda Gray's understudy from the Follies. The party has begun. And so here we've got this idea of, um, of celebrity um, or almost celebrity, um, of people expecting really fancy things to happen. I believe that on the first night I went to Gatsby's house, I was one of the few guests who had actually been invited. So now we're back to Nick uh, and his perspective rather than us being thrown into the party. People were not invited. They went there. They got into automobiles, which bore them out to Long Island, and somehow they ended up at Gatsby's door. Notice that this is kind of passive, that, they're, that it's not like they want to go to Gatsby's, but somehow uh, the quest for, for fun leads them there. Once they were introduced by somebody who knew Gatsby, and after that they conducted themselves according to the rules of behavior associated with an amusement park. So I want you to think about all of those amusement parks and what are the rules of behavior. There are people crying there. There are people, you know, running around trying to get to the next thing. Um, there are people laughing and having fun for sure, but there's always this kind of chaotic air. Sometimes they came and went without having met Gatsby at all. For the came for the party with a simplicity of heart that was its own ticket of admission. So this is interesting that this is how you get in, um, is that you don't care too deeply about anything. Um, you can't ha you can't be overly serious in order to be able to defend the Gatsby party. I had actually been invited. So now we have a short declarative sentence that brings us back to Nick and his moment. A, uniform, uh, a chauffeur in a uniform of rabbin's eye blue crossed my lawn early that Saturday morning with a surprisingly formal note from his employer. The honor would be entirely Gatsby's, it said, if I would attend his little party that night. He had seen me several times and had intended to call on me long before, but a peculiar combination of circumstances had prevented it, signed J. Gatsby in, in a majestic hand. So we're remembering kind of that uh, remote figure of Gatsby from the very, very end of the first chapter, where now we're starting to be reintroduced to him and all we have is this kind of remote party um, and this very, very formal invitation. Dressed up in white flannels, I went over uh, to his lawn a little after seven. Um, so here we've got white flannels, which is uh, real formal wear. Um, and something that, uh, that somebody from Nick's social class would understand as an expectation. Not necessarily the new fancy bobs and things like that. This is more kind of traditional uh, dress. 
and wandered around rather ill at ease among swirls and eddies of people I didn't know. So again, we've got Nick not knowing what to do with himself at parties, just like the apartment in the city. Here again, he doesn't really quite know how to fit in. Um, last time he was uncomfortable, so he got drunk. Um, it didn't, didn't work out all that well for him. And so let's see how this goes. Though here and there, there was a face that I had noticed on the commuting train. I was immediately struck by the number of young Englishmen dotted about it, dotted about, all well-dressed, all looking a little hungry, and all talking in low, earnest voices to, the, to solid and prosperous Americans. So here we've got differences between uh, the old English and Americans kind of thinking about what it means to be an American here, that there's that these... Uh, Englishmen are hungry. They seem to see Americans as prey in some way. Um, and these Americans are solid and prosperous, as if there's something to be gotten from these people. I was sure they were selling something, bonds or insurance or automobiles. They were at least agonize they were at least agonizingly aware of the easy money in the vicinity and convinced that it was theirs for a few words in the right key. So this idea of um of always looking for the next uh, the next sale this idea of money being exchanged hand, uh, being exchanged at these places not necessarily as a business proposition but as a place to maybe network and try to get get in somewhere as soon as i arrived i made an attempt to find my host but the two or three people of whom i asked his whereabouts stared at me in such an amazed way and denied so vehemently any knowledge of his movements that i slunk off in the direction of the cocktail table the only place in the garden where a single man could linger without without looking purposeless and alone um and so here this is idea this is interesting that they deny vehemently knowing the host as if it would be bad to have some sort of contact with gatsby I was on my way to getting roaring drunk, so this is kind of a repetition of what was going on in the last chapter, from sheer embarrassment when Jordan Baker came out of the house and stood at the head of the marble steps. So here we've got Jordan, and Jordan's going to be important uh, in this chapter. Leaning a little backward and looking with, uh, looking with contemptuous interest down into the garden. So again, we kind of get that idea of her looking down her nose, which kind of goes with that raised chin that we saw in chapter one. I mean, the idea that she stands so upright that maybe she's leaning a little bit backward. All of this stuff kind of is characteristic of Jordan Baker. Whether or not I found it welcome or not, please excuse me, I found it necessary to attach myself to someone before I should begin to address my cordial remarks to passers-by. So here it's just a, a, it's more kind of necessity. It's not that he's really looking for Jordan Baker, but she's someone that he can kind of glom on to so that he's a little bit less uncomfortable. Hello, I roared, advancing toward her. We get some of that awkwardness there. My voice seeming unnaturally loud across the garden. I thought you might be here, she responded absently as I came up. I remembered you lived next door to. She held my hand impersonally as a promise that she'd take care of me in a minute and gave her ears, her ear to two girls in twin yellow dresses who stopped at the foot of the steps. So notice that she's also not overly interested in Nick um, kind of saying hello, but she's uh, responding to him absently and, uh, and she's impersonal. Hello, they cried together. Sorry you didn't win. That was for the golf tournament. She had lost in the finals a week before. So here's where we find out exactly what type of an athlete Jordan Baker is. Um, so she is a golfer, which does become important. So if you can think about kind of the rules of golf, it's a solitary game. Um, it's very much kind of uh, working against yourself. It's what they call a gentleman's game, um, uh, very much about honor and integrity. You don't know who we are, said one of the girls in yellow, but we met you here about a month ago. You've dyed your hair since then, remarked Jordan, and I, start, and I started, but the girls had moved casually on, and her remark was addressed to the premature moon, produced like the supper, no doubt, out of a caterer's basket. So there's, again, this inauthenticity that, that's going on here, even though Jordan does seem to remember these people who would assume that she didn't. Um, all of these things, like that, even the moon um, is, is something that, uh, that Gatsby can kind of serve on a platter. With Jordan's slender golden arm resting in mine, um, and so here she is golden, that can certainly give us tan, but also this idea of heaviness, of value, um, but also kind of maybe going back to that glistening golden turkeys and things like that, that maybe it's a, um, that it's a fanciness to be seen. We descended the steps and sauntered about the garden. A tray of cocktails floated at us through the twilight. 
and we, uh, and we sat down at a table with the two girls in yellow and three men. Each one of us introduced, introduced to us as Mr. Mumble. Um, so this, it, please note that this is just that Nick can't understand them, so he just murmur, he's calling them Mr. Mumble. Do you come to these parties often? inquired Jordan of the girl be- beside her. The last one was, was the one I met you at. And the girl answered in, a, in an alert, confident voice. She turned to her companion. Notice that these are, we're consistently hearing them as girls, that they are somehow young, maybe immature, uh, maybe something else about them. Uh, she turned to her companion. Wasn't it for you too, Lucille? It was for Lucille too. I like to come, Lucille said. I never care what I do, and I always, so I always have a good time. So this idea, again, of that, uh, that not having a heavy heart, that lightness of heart, is what gives you the opportunity to have a good time. When I was here last, I tore my gown on a chair and he asked me my name and address. Inside a week, I got a package from Croyer's with a new evening gown in it. Did you keep it? Asked Jordan. Sure I did. I was going to wear it tonight, but it was too big and in the bust and had to be altered. It was gas blue with lavender beads, $265. And so this, if we get a translation, this is about $3,000 in today's money. Um, So Gatsby uh, has sent her a replacement dress after she has ripped hers which in theory was probably not a $3,000 dress, and replaced it. So just think about like a friend coming over to your house and ripping their jeans and sending them like a brand new pair of super designer jeans, um, even though they might have just been, you know, wearing something from, you know, from Target or something. There's something funny about the fellow who'll do something like that, said the other girl eagerly. He doesn't want any trouble with anybody. Really important characterization here for Gatsby is that the reasoning that they are intuiting for him sending this gown is that if he doesn't want any bad rumors to be spe- to be spread, he only wants good information about his party so that more people will come, uh, come, I suppose, or nobody will be angry with him. Who doesn't? I inquired. Gatsby told me. The two girls and Jordan leaned together confidentially. So here we've got this idea of gossip, um, kind of fun stuff going on. Somebody told me they thought he killed a man once. So it's exciting, these things that uh, since nobody knows him, lots of things can go on, can go uh, around about him. A thrill passed over all of us. The three Mr. Mumbles bent forward and listened eagerly. So we've got this really kind of close uh, physically close relationship among people who care absolutely nothing about one another. I don't think it's so much that, argued Lucille skeptically. I think it, it's more that he was a German spy during the war. So now we've got German spy, maybe killed a man, all these kind of things that are uh, a little sinister. One of the men nodded in confirmation. I heard that from, from a man who knew all about him, grew up with him in Germany, he assured us positively. Oh, no, said the first girl. It couldn't be that because he was in the American army during the war. So all of this stuff that, uh, it, that's contradictory, none of it can really go together to get, uh, as a whole for a person. As our credulity switched back to her, she leaned forward with enthusiasm. You look at him uh, sometimes when he thinks nobody's looking at him. I'll bet he killed a man. She narrowed her eyes and shivered. Lucille shivered. So this is very exciting um, to be a little bit nervous uh, about this. We all turned and looked, for Ga- looked around for Gatsby. It was testimony to the romantic speculation he inspired that there were whispers about him from those who, found little that it was, who had found little that it was necessary to whisper about in this world. So he is somehow special um, in order to be able to get this gossip. A lot of this stuff would just kind of be blah, blah, blah in most of these people's worlds. Um, and notice this idea of romantic speculation. Um, we Nick used that word romantic to describe Gatsby in chapter one at the very, very beginning in those first couple of pages. Um, so kind of this idea of unknown um, and, and things on the horizon. The first supper, there would be another one after midnight, was now being served. Again, abundance. And Jordan invited me to join her own party, who were spread around the table on the other side of the garden. There were three married couples and Jordan's escort, a persistent undergraduate given to violent innuendo, and obviously under the impression that sooner or later Jordan was going to yield him up to her person to a greater or lesser degree. So we get the idea of the person that uh, that Jordan is with is young. He's an undergraduate, so he's in college, so younger than Nick even. Um, 
and also that he kind of expects some sort of a sexual favor from Jordan for having gone with, or maybe indicating that there's a presumption that she is somehow open to such advances. Instead of rambling, this party had preserved a dignified homogeneity and assumed, itself, assumed to itself the function of representing the stead nobility of the countryside, East Egg condescending to West Egg, uh, and on careful guard against its, its spectro spectroscopic gaiety. So here we have to think about East and West Egg. And so this party means, um, uh, means essentially uh, Nick and Jordan and these other people. They are from East Egg. Um, and so they are the uh, they're on they are the nobility of the countryside. So they are old money. They are people who kind of understand how rules work and the um, and how society should work, hence Nick in his flannels and uh, and things like that. And kind of looking down upon this idea of spectroscopic gaiety, this letting go and just kind of being showy, showy, showy. It gives us a difference between those two places. Let's get out, whispered Jordan, after a somehow wasteful and inappropriate half hour. This is much too polite for me. So even after that, she's there representing, in theory, kind of that st stead nobility of East Egg. But at the same time, um, she's finding it too polite and might want to join the other thing. So there's this idea of maybe uh, the people who are in that sect wanting a little bit of this taste. We got up and she explained that we were going to find the host. I'd never met him, she said, and it was making me uneasy. The under undergraduate nodded in a cynical, melancholy way. He seems to recognize that he's being left behind. The bar, where we glanced first, was crowded, but Gatsby was not there. She couldn't find him from the top of the steps, and he wasn't on the veranda. On a chance, we tried an important-looking door and walked into a high Gothic library, paneled with carved English oak, and probably transported complete from some ruin overseas. So we get this idea of really fancy, uh, the idea of actually bringing an entire library in, in its entirety across, like on a ship. A stout, middle-aged man with enormous owl-eyed spectacles was sitting somewhat drunk on the edge of a great table, staring with unsteady concentration at the shelves of books. So here, this is somebody that we typically call owl eyes um, because he's got these spectacles. And we always think about owls, first of all, um, by using this word, what might we assume? Like we've got this idea of owls being wise um, and kind of talking in uh, in in. I always think of Owl from Winnie the Pooh, um, who's giving advice and understanding things. Um, and also we've got the idea of spectacles, of, of wearing glasses, this idea of um, that's going to come through here. We saw the, the eyes of T.J. Eckelberg, the uh, billboard in the Valley of Ashes. Um, and this idea of what can be seen and what can't be seen, this idea of glasses maybe giving somebody uh, the ability to see beyond the surface. Um, and he is drunk, though. As we entered, he wheeled excitedly around and examined Jordan head to foot. What do you think? He demanded impetuously. About what? He waved his hands toward, hand toward the bookshelves. About that. As a matter of fact, you needn't bother to ascertain. I ascertained they're real. As if they've asked a question, right? The books? He nodded. Absolutely real. Have pages and everything. I thought they'd be a nice, double, durable cardboard. Matter of fact, they're absolutely real. Pages and... Here, let me show you. Um... And so we've got this idea of the, the realness of these, that, that there is a possibility that books in a library like this would just be for show. It'd be like, you know, a 10 foot section or, or a four foot section of like a box that you would just kind of put in and it would just look like there are books there. Um, a lot actually as backgrounds for Zoom got sold over uh, throughout the pandemic here. Um, but here we think about the cost of books um, and that books are actually really, really expensive, especially hardcover books or leather bound books that would be the type that would be in this library. And so the cost to set up a library like this is enormous. Taking our skepticism for granted, he rushed to the bookcase and returned with volume one of the Stoddard Lecture. See, he cried triumphantly, it's a bona fide piece of printed matter. matter. It fooled me. This fe fellow's a regular Belasco. So another allusion here um, to kind of a Playboy um, show showboat uh, that uh, 
uh, I, I've got to look them up again. I've forgotten now. It's a triumph. What thoroughness. What realism knew when to stop, too. Didn't cut the pages. What do you want? What do you expect? So this idea of cutting the pages, um, this means, essentially, if you can picture an old book with, like, the, the painted edges, that um, what it means to cut a book is to open it up and the first time all of that paint kind of holds the pages together and you actually have to kind of push them to the side so that each page separates from another. So these books have never been read. They are just there for show, um, but they are a very, very expensive way to show. Could have showed just with the fakeness, but this, uh, this kind of realism within. He snatched back the he snatched the book from me and replaced it heavily on uh, hastily on its shelf. Muttered that if one brick was removed, the whole li library was liable to collapse. So we've got this idea of a house of cards that uh, that it's carefully constructed, but that it's also fragile. Um, that uh, this kind of uh, aura, this kind of image that's been built. Who brought you? He demanded. Or did you just come? I was brought. Most people here were brought. Jordan looked at him alert, alertly, cheerfully, without answering. I was brought by a woman named Roosevelt, he continued. Mrs. Claude Roosevelt. So here we're name dropping. Because uh, that's important. Do you know her? I met her somewhere last night. I've been drunk for about a week now, and I thought it might, be, it might sober me up to sit in a library. So we've got this idea of the kind of person who goes to a Gatsby party um, might be the kind of person who's in a constant state of inebriation. Um, and obviously the person who he's coming with is not a close friend. Has it? A little bit, I think. I can't, oh, I'm, yes. So he's trying to get sober. I can't tell yet. I've only been in, been here an hour. Did I tell you about the books? They're real. They're, you told us. We shook hands with him gravely and went back outdoors. There was dancing now on the canvas in the garden. Old men pushing young girls backward in ethereal, graceless circles. Superior couples holding each other torturously, fashionably, and keeping in the corners a great number of single girls dancing individualistically or relieving the orchestra for a moment of the burden of the banjo of, or, the, or the traps. So again, we've got young girls and, uh, and old men. So this idea of kind of what maybe the men who are coming here are looking for is this kind of youthful showiness, something to get access to some uh, to some girls who might be more entertainment than anything else. Um, that the girls also are taking over the burden of the banjo or the traps, that they're jumping in and kind of having fun with that. By midnight, the hilarity had increased, i.e. drinking more. Um, so thinking about the effect of alcohol here. A celebrated tenor had sung in Italian, and a notorious contralto had sung in jazz. And between the numbers, people were doing stunts all over the garden, while happy, vacuous bursts of laughter rose toward the summer sky. So now the guests become the entertainment, right? Um, so that uh, the, the party takes on its own kind of life. A pair of stage twins, who turned out to be the girls in yellow, did a baby act in costume, and champagne was served in glasses bigger than finger bowls. Um, a finger bowl, incidentally, uh, this is going to come from Nick's uh, understanding of, again, kind of society. A finger bowl is the, uh, is the bowl that comes around between courses at a multi-course meal that you rinse your little fingers in, um, so you can kind of picture the size of that. Um, and so we've got champagne in these huge glasses. Again, this idea of excess, but using but the comparative, the excess of just ostentatious wealth versus the stead nobility of using these bowls in a very kind of much quieter fashion. The moon had risen higher, and floating in the sound was a triangle of silver scales, trembling a little to the stiff, tiny drip of the banjos on the lawn. I sat, I was still with Jordan Baker. We were sitting at a table with a man of about my age and a rowdy little girl, again, this idea of a little girl, who gave way upon the slightest provocation to uncontrollable laughter. So, so these, these girls seem to, seem to have a lot of immaturity that they can't quite hang on to themselves like maybe a woman would, or a lady, if he were gonna use some of the same words that he's using for the females. I was enjoying myself now. I had taken two finger bowls of champagne. So remember, that's a lot. Those, those are those huge uh, 
champagne glasses, and the scene had changed before my eyes into something significant, elemental, profound. So remember that Nick is not used to drinking, and here it is making him very serious, as if this is something uh, something that, that he should get a lot of meaning out of. At a lull in the entertainment, the man looked at me and smiled. Um, and so this, this the man is this man of about his age. And if we think about how old Nick is, um, we know that he's graduated from college, that he spent some time in the war. Um, so we know that he's not super, he's not as young as this, say, college student. Um, so we're kind of guessing at age right now. We'll find out later. Your face is familiar, he said politely. Weren't you in the third division during the war? So here we've got a connection, okay? Finally, he's not entirely alone. Why, yes, I was in the 9th Machine Gun Battalion. I was in the 7th Infantry until June, 19, June 1918. I knew I'd seen you somewhere before. We talked for a moment about some wet, gray little villages in France. Evidently, he lived, uh, he lived in this vicinity, for he told me he had just bought, bought a hydroplane and was going to try it out in the morning. Want to go with me, old sport? Just near the shore along the sound. What time? Any time that suits you best. It was on the tip of my tongue to ask his name when Jordan looked around and smiled. Having a gay time now, she inquired. Much better. I turned again to my new acquaintance. So you'll notice that he feels better now that he's not um, kind of lost, that he's, he's found somebody that he can connect with. This is an unusual party for me. I haven't even seen the host. I live over there. I waved a hand in the, at the invisible hedge in the distance. And this man, Gatsby, sent his chauffeur over with an invitation. For a moment, he looked at me as if he failed to understand. I'm Gatsby he said suddenly. So here, this is our first actual introduction to Gatsby. Um, so we need to kind of recognize that we met him just like Nick did, not knowing his significance, that he's just kind of blending into the party, that he's just kind of hanging out there, um, not, uh, not orchestrating anything, but kind of nondescript talking about the war. What? I exclaimed. Oh, I beg your pardon. Oh, I thought you knew old sport. I'm afraid I'm not a very good host, um, which is odd because like all of the things that he does, all of the showiness um, does kind of show that host thing. I mean, he's bringing people back and forth to the city. He's got all of this stuff, but he's not interacting. Um, he's remote. Um, and that makes, so, so we've got this kind of duality of hosting as a function versus being a host. He smiled understandingly, much more than understandingly. And so here's Gatsby's smile. Um, really, really important. It was one of those rare smiles with a quality of an eternal reassurance in it that you may come across four or five times in your life. So we've got this idea of rarity. It faced or seemed to face the whole external world for an instant and then concentrated on you with an irresistible prejudice in your favor. It understood you just as far as you wanted to be understood, believed in you as you would like to believe in yourself, and assured you that it had precisely this, the impression of you that at your best you hoped to convey. So this is like the perfect smile that makes everybody just feel good. Precisely at that point, it vanished, and I was looking at an elegant young roughneck, a year or two over 30. So if he's the same age as Nick, we've got this idea that Nick's right there around 30 also, whose elaborate formality of speech just missed being observed. So we've got this elaborate formality of speech. Um, so he's throwing in these old sports um, and seems to be kind of um, trying really hard with his speech, um, but it's he's he's kind of pulling it off, but it's just on the edge. Sometime before he introduced himself, I got a strong impression that he was picking his words with care, um, so that he's trying, um, but not always succeeding, it seems. Almost at the moment when Mr. Gats Gatsby identified himself, a butler hurried toward him with the information that Chicago was calling him on the wire. So if we're thinking about Chicago in the 1920s, you might be thinking about, um, you should, probably should be thinking about gangsters, um, and, uh, um, and all of the kind of underground that's going on in Chicago at this point. And here Gatsby is getting a phone call from Chicago in the middle of the night, clearly something important to be getting a phone call in the, in the middle of the night. 
He excused himself with a small bow that included each of us in turn. If you want anything, just ask for it, old sport, he urged me. Excuse me, I will rejoin you later. When he had gone, I, am, I turned immediately to Jordan, constrained to assure her of my surprise. I had expected that Mr. Gatsby would be a florid and corpulent person in his middle years. So he assumes, which is interesting that he sees him as fat um, and kind of, um, and florid would be kind of like drunk and kind of soft. Um, and so this idea that he's seen him, but he's only seen the um, the outline of Gatsby, even that outline didn't quite fit this, but this idea that somebody must be older and fatter in order to kind of have all this ostentatious wealth. Who is he, I demanded, do you know? He's just a man na named Gatsby. I love this line um, because it gets to the heart of kind of the impersonalness that um, that we don't, the, Jordan doesn't really know him, even though she's met him a couple of times. Nobody at the party really knows him. He's just a man, um, and this kind of uh, this kind of makes him less important. Where is he from? I mean, and what does he do? Well, now you're started on the subject. She answered with a wan smile. Well, he told me once he was an Oxford man, uh, and so we've got this idea of possibly having attended Oxford in England. Um, but again, we've had all of these rumors, but this one actually comes from. Gatsby. A dim background started to take shape behind him, but at her next remark, it faded away. However, I don't believe it. Why not? I don't know, she insisted. I just don't think he went there. So all of these, like, things that, like, maybe he killed a man, maybe he's a German spy, maybe he's in the American army, like, conflicting things. Nothing really makes sense about Gatsby. Something in her tone reminded me of the other girls I think he killed a man and had the effect of stimulating my curiosity. So just like everybody else, he is intrigued. I would have accepted without question the information that Gatsby sprang from the swamps of Louisiana or from the Lower East Side of New York. Um, this idea of, you know, of, of being able to spring from nothing. That was, the com that was comprehensible, but young men didn't, at least in my provincial experience, I believe they didn't, drift coolly out of nowhere and buy a place on, the Long, on Long Island Sound. Anyhow, he gives large parties, said Jordan, changing the subject with an urban distaste for the concrete. And I like large parties. They're so intimate. At small parties, there isn't any privacy. And so here we get this really interesting um, uh, paradox, right, that somehow small parties are less private than big ones. And so if we contrast the party in the apartment, which was just a few people, but it was like everybody on top of each other and you couldn't really, um, you couldn't really help but know what everybody was doing um, versus here you can get lost in the crowd. Um, and while a lot of things are going on, none of it's personal. Um, we're seeing people from afar with these tricks and it doesn't, none of it really matters. And this is also good characterization for Jordan um, in that she appreciates that. She appreciates the lack of intimacy. There was, a, there was the boom of a bass drum and the voice of the orchestra leader rang out suddenly above the echolalia of the garden. That's the other sounds. Ladies and gentlemen, he cried, at the request of Mr. Gatsby, we are going to play for you Mr. Vladimir Tostov's latest work, which attracted so much attention at Carnegie Hall last May. So again, we're getting like uh, the, the cream, the fanciest stuff uh, that's, that's coming out. If you read the papers, you know there was a big sensation. He smiled with jovial condescension, um, and so, which is interesting because he's fun, but that, he's, that even the orchestra direction is talking down and added some sensation whereupon everybody laughed. So there seems to be like some sort of an inside joke. Um, like, is this really fancy or is it not fancy? We're not really sure. This pe the piece is known, he concluded lustily, as Vladimir Tostov's Jazz History of the World. And so again, we're reminded that we're in the jazz age. We're in this kind of place where, um, in theory, this is where we would, s a Gatsby party is where we would see the flappers and dresses. And these are the girls, potentially. Um, that uh, that don't have a whole lot of maturity about them. 
The nature of Mr. Tostoff's composition eluded me, because it, ju- uh, because it just because just as it began, my eyes fell on Gatsby standing alone on the marble steps and looking from one group to another with approving eyes. So again, he is remote. He is separated from everybody else, standing on marble steps. So kind of above and the coldness and hardness of marble, um, kind of. Uh, it might extend themselves to Gatsby there, um, but he's somehow approving of all of this. Uh, so what's he approving of? Is it that people are having fun, that you know things are going a certain way? His tanned skin was drawn attractively tight on his face, and his short hair looked as, it, as if it was trimmed every day. So again, this is reminding me of the food on the table, um, this kind of perfect image um, that, that might not have as much, like, whenever I think of that food, I don't think of, like, deliciousness. I think, like, oh, doesn't that look nice? Same thing here. I could see nothing sinister about him. Um, so that's kind of the opposite of the he killed a man. I wondered if the fact that he was not drinking helped set, helped to set him off from his guests, for it seemed to me that he grew more correct as the fraternal hilarity increased. So notice that he is not drinking. Everybody else, even Nick, is drinking like crazy. That that booze is what's fueling this party. And yet, he is growing more correct that somehow he looks like he's above it all. Um, Or maybe he's kind of removing himself from it a little bit more as everybody else is getting happier and more funny and kind of more brotherly, closer together. He's again more remote. When the jazz history of the world was over, girls were putting their heads on men's shoulders, again, girls and men, in a puppyish, convivial way. Girls were swooning backward playfully into men's arms, so girls and men again. And these are girls who swoon, um, like, like they need to be saved, um, but they're doing it playfully, even into groups, knowing that someone would arrest their falls. So there's a trust to this that you can kind of do this in this circumstance and everybody's kind of looking out for each other, it seems. But no one swooned backward on Gatsby. So there may be a lack of trust, like he's not one of them. And no French bob touched Gatsby's shoulder and no singing quartets were formed with Gatsby's head for one link. So notice this repetition of no, 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 um, that he's like the negation of the party, even though it's his party. I beg your pardon. Gatsby's butler was suddenly standing beside us. Miss Baker, he inquired, I beg your pardon, but Mr. Gatsby would like to speak with you alone. With me? She exclaimed in surprise. Yes, madame. And that's where we'll leave off for now.